All right, this morning, as I already told you, we're looking at the triumphal entry. It's recorded for us by Luke in Luke 19, verses 28 through 40. So I'd like to read that as we begin. And hopefully, again, we'll, we'll see something of how this, well, basically fits in God's plan of redemption. This is the unfolding. This is the revelation of His mercy and grace as our Lord Jesus is going now into Jerusalem for the last week of His life where He will lay down His life in order to save us from our sins. And I know we hear that quite a bit, but I hope that we understand and can appreciate uh, what, what that means. Um, and really, the, as again, it was it uh, Robert Mary McShane writes in that one hymn that we have in the hymn, though, we really will not fully understand until the day of judgment when we see the wicked, you know, as he says, sh start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink as they're basically pushed into the lake of fire where they will endure in torment forever and ever and realizing except for what Jesus did here, that's where we would be also. So this, this is what we read in Luke 19 beginning in verse 28. After he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached Bethphage and Bethany, Near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away went, um, uh, those who were sent went away and found it, just as he had told them. As they were <clears throat> untying the colt, its owner said to, to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, uh, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he was going, uh, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Well, may the Lord bless uh, this portion of His Word to our understanding this morning. And again, may the Lord show us something of the glory of this, this event. Now, this morning, as I've already said, we come to a very special moment in the history of redemption, in God's plan to save His people, in God's plan to save us. And we need to understand that this is one in a sequence of very special moments, many that the Lord gave throughout the history of, of redemption, the history of His the outworking of His plan of salvation, which is really what the Bible is a record of from the fall to the final redemption. Now, at first, these special moments were all pointing forward, of course, to this one who was coming. After the fall, God mercifully appeared to Adam and Eve to promise that He would send to them a Savior who would take basically what the devil had done and would turn that all around again. He would reverse the curse and bring, as it were, back the, the earth into its pristine condition and that He would save His people. When the evil that had been introduced into the world by Adam and Eve became so great that it threatened to basically threaten God's promise and the fulfillment of that promise, God destroyed the world with a flood. But again, here was one of those special moments where He mercifully spared Noah and his family through the ark which was a picture of this salvation that He was bringing through this Savior. And even after the flood, when evil became again widespread, you know, the Lord, we might say, set the clock back, and that's really the reason for the um, dispersal of the people and the changing of the languages at the Tower of Babel, was He didn't want it to reach a point where it threatened His promise to send the Savior into the world. So He divided all the peoples and sent them their, their own way. But, of course, that didn't stop them. Evil continued to become widespread so that the Lord called Abraham and set him apart from 
the people that, that he came from, it's likened in the Bible as basically digging Abraham out of a pit because that's what the world again and what society had become. But he called him and set him apart and promised to give him a child that he would send into the world that one day would be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. We know that God sent his people into Egypt to save them from a famine, but while they were there, Pharaoh enslaved them. But he sent Moses into the land in order to lead them out into the promised land, which was a picture, another picture, another one of those special moments where the Lord was looking forward to the promised Savior, the promised Deliverer, who would one day deliver us from the iron furnace of sin, which is this world, and would lead us to heaven. And then finally, when they later asked for a king, and again, they did so out of sinful, you know, sinful desires, God gave them a king, first after their own heart, and then when that one failed, after his own heart, he gave them David and promised that one day he would set one of his descendants on his throne and establish his kingdom forever. Well, we do know that all of these things were pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the seed of the woman who, through his work on the cross, destroyed the devil and has, in principle, reversed the curse on the creation. And that includes those who have trusted in him. If we've trusted in Christ, we are a new creation already within Him. We know that He is the ark of God's safety, that if we are in Him, if we are in Christ, in the ark, we will be saved from the flood of God's judgment, which is going to come upon the world one day. We know that He is the son of Abraham, who is bringing blessing to all the nations today, and He is our deliverer, of course, who is leading us out of the misery of this world, and one day will bring us into the new heavens and the new earth. This morning, I think we see emphasized for us the fact that he is the son of David, the one that the Lord has, um, has promised would, he would seat upon David's throne and who would reign over us forever. And that's really what his presentation to Israel is all about. So this morning, we see his kingship revealed in one of those special New Testament moments, events. Jesus now comes to Jerusalem to present himself to her as her, her king. Now, what I want us to do from this text is really look at a few different things as we're working our way to the main point, and the main point, of course, is the glory of this moment. But what I'd like us to see is this, Jesus' ascent to Jerusalem, the disciples' joyful response to that ascent, the Pharisees' critical response, and again, as I've already mentioned, the glory of this moment, the fulfillment of God's promises. Now, first of all, we see his ascent to Jerusalem. Luke writes in verse 28, after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Now, we know that these things are basically pointing backwards to the parable that he had just spoken of the ten minas, and I think it would be good for us to review this because we're going to see really a good example of it in our text. Uh, Jesus had taught this um, parable to the crowds and to his disciples in order to show them that the kingdom that they th thought was coming was not the one that really was coming, and it wasn't coming in the time frames they were expecting. Jesus was not going up to Jerusalem to receive an earthly crown. He wasn't coming, as I've said before, to overthrow the Romans and to sit on David's throne in Jerusalem, ruling over Israel. Rather, he was actually going to Jerusalem in order to depart from there to heaven to receive a much larger kingdom. He was going to become ruler of the world, and he would rule, of course, from heaven. Now, the parable also taught us that while he was gone, he wanted the disciples to continue to preach the gospel to the Jews first, and then also to the Gentiles and then he said he would return, which he did. And, and by the way, we saw last time, this was not his second coming, but this was his coming in judgment against Jerusalem in 70 AD, when he would not only reward the disciples that he had charged to preach the gospel for their faithfulness with places of honor within his kingdom, but he would bring judgment upon those who would not have him as their king. Now, again, here we see that division between those that belong to Jesus and those who do not belong to Jesus. Jesus said, even among those who receive the minus, 
which represented those who were professing faith in Him. There would be those who would be faithful with the things He had given to them to increase those things, and there would be those represented by the one who would do nothing with what He had given to them, and they would end up with the same judgment as that other group of people who would not have this king to rule over them. I think this is a reminder of what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. You know, uh, we, we love to talk about the gospel and everything that Jesus Christ has done for us, and we know that He's done everything to be accepted by the Father. But what Jesus is referring to here is that change that will take place in our lives that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. When we see, again, the glory of Christ and receive Him, it will transform our lives from the inside out. And the evidence that we know Him in a saving way is that we will surrender to His Lordship in more than just praise, Lord, Lord, but in actually doing the will of His Father. You know, the interesting thing about the, the Calvinistic way of looking at things, you know, we, we look at the, the way that Arminians look at things and they say that in many cases, you work up the faith and then you work up the obedience and you walk that straight line and that's how you get into heaven. It basically makes all the works your works, you know. Jesus makes up for the mistakes, but you still got to do the work, stay in line, and to keep moving towards heaven. Well, that's the way Arminians look at it, but Calvinism doesn't leave us off the hook, does it? Because it says that Christ did it all and we're accepted by His grace and His mercy alone. Through, we receive it by grace through faith alone, but that faith isn't alone. That faith sanctifies, which means that those works will be there. But it's not works that, that earn our salvation. It's rather the evidence that we have been saved. And Jesus is talking about that evidence. It needs to be there in our lives. It's not enough to believe that Jesus is Savior. It's not enough to acknowledge that He is Lord. We have to obey Him as our King if we are finally going to arrive in heaven. But you see, the point behind all of this is simply this that everyone who is born of the Spirit of God will obey Jesus, not perfectly, but will seek perfection. And that's what we need to be striving for. If we don't desire that, then that means that we need to be using the means of grace more and separating ourselves from the world more because that's what's killing that desire. Well, as I've said, Jesus wasn't going to do what they expected but Jesus was still their king, and he was still presenting himself to them as their king. Luke tells us that he approached Bethphage and Bethany in verse 29. Now, Bethany, as you likely know, was a village on the Mount of Olives, uh, on the way, really, from Jericho to Jerusalem, about two miles away from the holy city. And Bethphage was a little bit closer to Jerusalem, about one and a quarter miles away. And as he approached these two towns, he sent two of his disciples, and none of the gospel writers actually tell us which two, which means it's really not that important, to go into a village, likely Bethphage, but it could have been Bethany, where they would find a young donkey that no one had ever ridden, and they were to untie it and bring it to Jesus. By the way, our Lord knew that the colt would be there and gave them instructions Again, reminding us the Father is putting everything in place. Jesus sees the plan, and as these things unfold, his disciples should be saying, well, you know, again, just being confirmed in their minds, this is the Son of God. Now, they were to go in the town and find this colt and untie it, and if anyone asks why they were taking it, they were simply to say, the Lord has need of it, and the owners would allow it. So they went and found the colt, the owners asked, what are you doing? And they told them what Jesus told them to say. And then the owners, even though Luke doesn't spell it out here, we know there was no struggle. They didn't have to make off with the colt. We know from the other gospels, the, the owners of the colt said, take it, right? Now, we might ask the question, and maybe you've asked this before, why is it that they did this? Why did they let them just simply take the colt? Well, it's because they knew uh, who the Lord was that needed it, and they were willing 
to give him whatever it is he needed, whatever he asked, right? Uh, we don't often think about this, but if we were reading John's gospel, we would see that just a few days earlier, Jesus was in Bethany. And this is where he raised Lazarus from the dead. And there were many Jews from the surrounding area when Lazarus had died who had come down to console Mary and Martha over his death. And when they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, they believed. And at that point, they basically fell into that category of people that Jesus says we all need to be in if we are to follow him. And that is that we would give up whatever we possess and put it at our Lord's disposal. Well, that's exactly what they did. Jesus needed the colt, the, and so they gave him the colt so that he could ride it into Jerusalem. How can you withhold from the Lord what it is that he needs or desires from us to do his will? Well, the reason Jesus needed the colt is another question, and there it was to present himself to Israel as her king, as Zechariah the prophet had said, the Lord said through Zechariah. Now, you probably notice that when, whenever, usually when we read about kings and prophets and so forth riding something, it's, it's usually not on a horse, right? But it's usually on either a donkey or a mule. And there's a reason for that. Because throughout their history, the Lord told His people, do not keep horses, do not keep chariots, you know, that's one, one of the areas that Solomon failed. He had huge stalls. He had, I think, hundreds or thousands of horses and chariots. Now, there's a reason why the Lord didn't want them to have these horses and chariots, and that was because that was a symbol of power. That was a very powerful thing to have a horse and to have a chariot, and God did not want them to put their trust in those horses, in those chariots. He wanted them to trust Him to deliver them. By the way, I, sh I should also mention, this is another reason why the Lord warns us against, against going after the things of the world, you know, the possessions of the world, uh, the, the money, as it were, in this world, wealth, is because of our tendency, and we have a tendency to do, remember, everything wrong, even as believers, okay, still have the sin within us that's going to be moving us in the wrong direction, the tendency is to trust in the riches or in the money, in the wealth for our well-being, for our care, uh, rather than on the Lord. Now, again, our, we've, we've noted several times the Lord is not telling us that we can't have things. We all have things. We all have possessions. We all need money to survive, but we should never put our trust in that money. And the more that we have, the more likely we are to do this. The problem is that money is uncertain, but the Lord is certain. And the Lord tells us perhaps um, even warns us, well, actually, He does warn us through Solomon, that if we put too much hope in our money, we may find our money sort of fly away from us. Listen to what Solomon writes in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle, that flies toward the heavens. It's interesting that the richest man in the world would say that, but he understood about the uncertainty of riches because at any time the Lord could take those things away. We all know uh, from, well, from this world that people who often are, are hoping to get rich might try some pretty risky things and they see their money basically fly away. The Lord tells us, don't put your trust, your hope in money. Put your hope in Him. Now, again, that's the reason why he didn't want, to have, didn't want Israel to have horses. Now, the fact that the horses, of course, were scarce in Israel is the reason why we see the kings and the prophets riding donkeys or mules. When Solomon, the first son of David to become king, was anointed king over Israel, he rode to Gihon where he was anointed on a mule. Now, here we see David's greater son riding a donkey as he prepares to receive his kingdom, as the Lord said that he would through Zechariah. Matthew quotes him in Matthew 21, verses 4 through 5. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, 
gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. The fact that Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on the colt should have been a cue to Israel that this is one of those special moments when the Lord was fulfilling His Word. You know, Jesus said on another occasion in John 10, verse 35, the Scripture cannot be broken. Everything that the Lord says, He will bring to pass. This is another reason why we need to get into the Word of God, why we need to read the Word of God, why we can trust the Word of God, and why we should follow what it says, because the Lord is actually serious about everything that He says in His Word. And He's serious about what we've just seen that He said, about, again, the qualifications for discipleship and what it is that He works out in our lives. If we find that we have that desire and we're struggling and we know that's God's will, we know we can look to Him and ask Him and He will give to us a greater desire to do those things. Now, one other thing I just want us to notice before we see the reaction of the disciples is this. We do need to remember that Jesus wasn't going to Jerusalem at that moment to be crowned. He was going at that moment to lay down His life as a sacrifice for us. And yet, He was willing to go knowing that this would happen to Him there and knowing that this was the only way that He could save us from God's judgment. Let me just add that as an additional incentive when the Lord calls us to do things that are somewhat difficult to remember what He was willing to do for us and to know that He actually did this so that we would be willing to do what He calls us to do. We should be faithful to Him and we should worship Him. And really, that's what we see the disciples doing next. So first we see our Lord's ascent to Jerusalem and what that meant, how this is one of those special moments in redemptive history. But second, we see the disciples see this and they worship the Lord in verses 35 through 38. So they went out, got the donkey, they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. As He was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as He was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now the two disciples brought the colt to Jesus, laid their coats on it in order to make a comfortable seat for our Lord to ride on. The rest of the disciples, because of the things that they had seen and because they understood, this is one of those special moments where the Lord is fulfilling His promise. They took basically their coats and they threw them on the road in front of Him. And we might wonder what was the purpose behind that, but this is something the Jews would do to, to celebrate, to express their joy and their rejoicing in the Lord because their hopes and their prayers were being answered. The king had finally come to Zion, and this king, as we saw, is the Lord. Now, Matthew also adds this. They shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. And I think you know by now, Hosanna means save, I pray, save. Now, we likely have understood that, and we've read this, and we believe that what they're doing is calling on Jesus to save them from their sins. Now, that is, in fact, what Jesus came to do, but really what they were doing was they were thinking politically. Save us from the tyranny of the Romans. Reestablish the kingdom of Israel. You know, sadly, even Jesus' own disciples, again, believe that. But they were praising Him for that reason. And if they had understood what Jesus had really come to do, how much louder might they have shouted and praised the Lord for His redemption? So the reaction of the disciples is they're worshiping God and praising Him. But thirdly, we see that not everybody was rejoicing. Okay, there was another group of people there. Uh, Luke writes, some of the Pharisees in the crowd who undoubtedly represented the majority of the Pharisees, not all of them, there was a few that believed, but most of them said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Rebuke your disciples. 
Command them to be quiet. In other words, silence this blasphemy, which is basically coming from your disciples. Now, I think we also understand that the Jews, the Jewish leaders in Judea hated Jesus more than any of the others outside, you know, in Galilee, right? Uh, because Jesus did particular miracles in the face of them that seemed to provoke them more than others. On one occasion, uh, he broke the Sabbath in their view by telling a man to pick up his, his cot and to carry it on the Sabbath, which was not a breaking of the Sabbath, but rather it was showing everybody who knew this man that Jesus had healed him. And, of course, on another occasion, he called God his Father. And by the way, the Jews understood what Jesus meant by that. He was making himself equal with God. Well, John tells us in John 5.18 that because of this, they were seeking to kill him. And that's why Jesus had to be careful when he went up to the feast year after year because they were always watching for him, trying to find some place where he might not be guarded and they might be able to take him. Well, now their hatred is fueled even further by what the disciples and the crowds were saying about him. Matthew says that they called him the son of David. Mark, or basically John, the king of Israel. Mark tells us they said, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. And Luke, of course, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And what they meant by this was this is the fulfillment of God's promise to raise up one of David's descendants and seat him on David's throne. They knew that this was the Messiah. Now, to the people, that was a cause of rejoicing, but not to these Pharisees because in their eyes, the title King and Messiah made him a threat to Rome and so a threat to their agreement with Rome and their cushy lives. So this had to stop. Now, I want us to notice again just the different reactions between the crowds and the Pharisees. And I want us to notice what Jesus had said to the Pharisees on other occasions, that these Pharisees were not doing this out of ignorance. The Pharisees knew who Jesus was. They had seen His miracles. And more than the crowds, they understood what these things actually meant. But their response to it was completely different. You know, in the case of Lazarus, which we were just referring to a few moments ago, the crowds saw Jesus, and they saw the resurrection of Lazarus, and their reaction was to believe. They believed in Jesus, and we've seen also how that worked itself out in the way they were living. They, they gave Jesus the use of the cult. But the Pharisees saw the same miracle, and their reaction was, let's kill Lazarus. Let's put him back in the grave because so many people are believing in Jesus because of this miracle. Now, that's how different believers and unbelievers can actually be. Remember how we were reading at the beginning in John chapter 1, the light comes into the darkness, and the darkness could not comprehend it. They don't see the glory of Jesus. They don't see His value, even though they know Jesus is fulfilling Scripture, and they believe that Scripture yet they still reject Him. Well, the difference is, of course, we as believers see God and we see Christ and we see what He's doing through spiritual eyes. We see the glory of it, but unbelievers are blind to these things. All they think about is how it threatens them rather than the beauty of it. We hear God's Word through spiritual ears. But we have to understand that unbelievers, the Bible says, they are deaf. That's why we love Him, because we can see and we can hear. That's why we listen to what He says. And that's why unbelievers not only don't listen to Him, but they are basically provoked by what they see. Now, that's also, of course, what makes the distinction between the way we live and the way we, and they live and why we will be numbered among the sheep on that final day while they will be among the goats and cast out of His presence. Now, finally, the last thing we see here is that Jesus tells us about the glory of this redemptive moment, just how, how great it is in response to the, to the Pharisees' request uh, 
to tell your disciples basically to shut up. Jesus says in verse 40, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Now, we do know that when Jesus Christ came into the world, remember His birth, how the Lord sent an angelic choir in order to praise Him. He also sent some shepherds to where He was lying in the manger, and the shepherds worshipped Him. His presentation now as king must also be marked with praise, so much so that if the crowds don't do this, Jesus says the creation would begin to worship Him because He is worthy and because of the importance of this moment. Now, I don't know what we think about when we think about the rocks crying out, but uh, Jesus could have meant that they would have shouted praises, but they don't have lungs and, and they, don't, they really can't carry a tune. <laughs> Um, I think he more likely meant that the ground would quake and the rocks would split. You know, when he talks about the creation rejoicing, how the hills, you know, basically are clapping, well, the, the, the trees of the field are clapping their hands and so forth. He doesn't mean they're actually out there clapping, but what he means is that they're, they're moving, you know, the way they move. And I think that's probably what he's referring to here. You know, when Jesus died on the cross and his disciples were silent, the earth began to shake and the, mount, uh, the, the rocks cracked and even many of the graves were opened. You know, there was this rejoicing that was going on even at that moment because of what the Lord of glory was doing. Uh, the creation itself was actually being set free from its corruption because of that act of our Lord Jesus Christ and the creation was rejoicing. And of course, now that Jesus has conquered death, for us, and He's been exalted over all creation. How much more is He worthy of our praise? Now, the point behind all of this that I want us to see this morning is that we should respond uh, to what our Lord has done and His completed work, not just His entrance into Jerusalem, but His completed work in the way that He calls us to, and that is by worshiping Him. Okay, we should see the glory of this. We should say with the disciples, blessed is the king. We should recognize who he is. Jesus is worthy. We should see that how important this is to the work of our redemption that our Lord Jesus Christ comes into Jerusalem. Now, how do we show him that worship? Well, one of the ways, of course, is by braving, you know, the coronavirus and uh, by gathering together on the Lord's day uh, as his people. To worship. You know, what we do here, I don't know if we understand this, but this is really what our Lord calls us to do, what He commands us to do. And something that, as Augustine would say, Lord, you know, command what you will and give what you command. And what He meant by that was, you have the right to tell me what to do, but Lord, give me the desire to do that too, because that's the only way I'm going to do it. And that's exactly what God does. That's what it means when He writes His commandments on our hearts, is He gives us the desire to do it. So the Lord calls us together on the Lord's day and it's in our heart to submit and to obey that because that's what we want to do. He wants us to meet together to worship Him for what He has done, but particularly for who He is because He is worthy of our praise. That's what it means when, when we say He's God, you know. When people worship their gods, right? And when we say He is our God, that means that we are to worship Him. And since He's the only true God, He's the only one that we should worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And He wants us to do that together, which is why He calls us together to worship Him, that we might encourage one another by our gathering, by our mutual faith, and that we might use our gifts also to minister to one another. Well, the Lord wants us to worship also in our homes, right? As families, if we still have our families at home to pray together, perhaps to discuss Scripture together, but to worship Him. We have what are called our prayer closets. We need to get alone with the Lord. That, by the way, was Luther's secret of spiritual power and strength. He prayed for two hours every day. And, you know, you're, we're never going to be as spiritually strong as Luther unless we spend more time with the Lord. There's just no way around it. We need to worship Him. And by the way, he wants that worship to extend to everything that we do in life. Remember how Paul says that uh, 
Um, we should offer ourselves as living sacrifices, um, which is our reasonable service of worship. Not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. Worshiping the Lord everywhere and everything we do, openly before the world. That's the way the kingdom of God actually advances when we're willing to worship Him openly. Now, He's certainly worthy of that praise and worship. He is God, and He is a glorious God, and He is a gracious and merciful God who has saved us from our sins. So He deserves to be first in our hearts, and we need to, as it were, enthrone Him there. There's an old uh, praise song we used to sing, Jesus, I enthrone you. I, we, or we enthrone you. We proclaim you are king. Yeah, we don't put Jesus on his throne, and we don't actually, you know, the only thing we can do is basically enthrone him in our hearts, which means put him first in our hearts and give ourselves to him as a continual act of worship. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to do that. He is worthy, and may he show us that he is worthy. Let's bow, shall we, for a moment of prayer and ask for his grace to do that.